Greetings, everyone. This is Professor Jeffrey Burleson, uh, Director of Piano Studies at Hunter College. And once again, for the uh, third time in a week, but um, for the over that week, for the first time in over a year, I am at Hunter College. We are at Hunter College in Lang Recital Hall. Once again, this is not a backdrop. As I turn it around, Zoom can't do this. See, there's the stage and all of that. So I'm uh, reporting to you here from the audience. Uh, this is the uh, second piano master class um, for the uh, spring 2021 semester. And today we are very uh, pleased and honored to have Catherine Kautsky with us. I'll tell you a little bit about Professor Kautsky. I'll start with the New York Times quote, which is uh, pretty uh, amazing. A pianist who can play Mozart and Schubert as though their sentiments and habits of speech coincided exactly with hers. The music spoke directly to the listener with neither, neither obfuscation nor pretense. And I would say that's a very fair description of Professor Kautsky's playing. Um, Professor Kautsky's students have won prizes across the country and have entered leading graduate programs. Uh, she is the George and Marjorie Olson Chandler Chair in Music at Lawrence University Conservatory of Music uh, in Wisconsin, and was the 2016 winner of the Lawrence Excellence in Teaching Award there. She also taught uh, for six years as piano faculty and chair of the keyboard department at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Her book, amazing book, Debussy's Paris, Piano Portraits of the Belle Epoque, was published by Rowan and Littlefield in September 2017 and has been met with uh, amazing and well-deserved accolades. I highly recommend it to anybody interested in pianism and French music and Debussy in the Belle Epoque, any of these areas. It's just a, a fascinating and illuminating book on many, many levels. I've had the honor of being uh, Kathy's friend, I think for about seven years now. Uh, we initially met at the Interharmony Festival in Italy uh, and about, well, about seven years ago, I think. And um, we've uh, been artist faculty members at the festival continuously since then until it was briefly shut down due to COVID. Uh, and it's just been an absolute uh, pleasure for her to be my, my Italian friend or my friend in Italy. We've interacted a little bit in New York as well. Um, and uh, she is just uh, an amazing um, artist, teacher, and human being. And I'm so pleased that our students will be able to play for her today. So we have uh, three students playing. Uh, first of all, uh, 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 Professor Kautsky, say hi to everyone. Hi, and thank you to you, Jeff. That's one of the loveliest introductions anyone's ever given me. And it's so, so mutual. I'm so oh. grateful to know you and that you invited me. So, well, thank you, thank you so much. Yourself. Thank and you so you much. Mentioned that we, it turned out that we actually studied with the same person, of course. That's um, right, too. And we're okay. comparing notes. Our, our, I think, um, our, our, was, was, was he the final teacher for you, so to speak, as well? Yes. So, uh, we, we share in common a, a, a lineage through, uh, the amazing, uh, sublime mensch Gilbert Kalish uh, from Stony Brook University. We both uh, got our uh, doctorates there with uh, this. Many of you know who Gilbert Kalish is and he knows, needs no introduction, but we share that that lineage as well. So we're we're sort of cousins uh, pianistically in, in that in that realm as well. Uh, so uh, we have three performers today. Um, the first uh, will be playing a piece by Henri Dutilleux. The second will be playing um, Chopin's first ballade. And the third will be playing the first movement of Beethoven's uh, Opus 22 Sonata. So without further ado, um, I would like to welcome uh, Karen Shea to the stage, who will be playing uh, Dutilleux's Au Gré des Andes, uh, title relative, um, more or less means according to the waves. It's, it's a bunch of miniatures. Um, and rather than sort of read all of them off, they should be in the YouTube chat, but I think that uh, maybe just to save time in the course of going through this, 
Professor Kautsky can mention the name of, of each movement after sure. it's played with the with you know during the discussion. Uh, so um, Karen, please take it away and enjoy.
I know your name is Karen. Is that right? Is that right? right. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so first off, fantastic. That was fabulous. It was like perfect, um, and and not not easy to do at all. And wonderful for us to hear that music because I I only knew one of these. One of my most adventurous students had played. The first one. Um, so if I didn't know them, probably most of the people there didn't know them either. And it's it's great to hear them. Duchi is a wonderful composer. So bravo to you both on on um, choosing the repertoire and on how you did it. It's it's terrific. Thank you so, much. Um, so it seems to me that maybe what's hardest about these is that they're very sort of mechanistic. That is, most of them are kind of perpetual mobile as they set up one particular rhythm and that rhythm goes. And it's really easy for it then to sound very mechanical. Um, and I think you probably have to sort of work against that tendency because if you give into it too much, the piece is going to get very, it's going to get humdrum, it's going to get boring. It's going to feel like, oh, we've heard 16th notes long enough already. Um, so I, I had a couple of thoughts about that. One was, it would be useful, this is very, this sounds sort of silly, but it would be useful if you had adjectives that you associated with each one. Um, and I wondered if we could start with that and then go from there to looking at what, it, what are the surprising elements in each one of these movements. Um, so when we look at the prelude, I, I think maybe some of the accidentals, the ways that he shifts from a sharp to a natural when one doesn't expect it, and are there ways that you could be bringing that out more? So let's start with the first thing, though. If you were, so the first one for audience members is called Prelude en Versus, which just means um, like a cradle song, rocking a lullaby, right? Do you, do you know any, do you know any other versuses? I don't. Oh, okay, you, you, I'll, I'll recommend a couple for you to get to know. Um, the most famous versus in the world is probably Chopin's. Um, which is a far longer and more complex piece than this is, but also wonderfully, wonderfully soothing. Um, there's also a beautiful versus in the Do Foray Dali suite. Um, so both Foray and Chopin, of course, are, are sort of French um, composers, Chopin as an adopted French composer. But um, the, the versus seems to have, the French seem to have an affinity for that. So what, what adjectives might you think of for the first? What, what do you want me to feel when I listen to this? I feel like a tired mother singing this lullaby to her child. <laughs> do you have children? No. <laughs> but you seem prescient in that case. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, in enormously soothing, right? Um, so, of course, there's a fine line between soothing and boring. Uh, so you have to be careful about that because you want the baby to go to sleep, but you want to remain interested in what you have to say. Um, so yes, any any other um, adjectives that come to mind? A little dreadful. Dreadful. That's interesting. Nightmarish. Uh, what was it? Nightmarish. nightmarish. Mm -hmm. How how so? What aspects of it seem dreadful and nightmarish to you? When it drops into the lower. It's like you can hear the melody that's from the intro, but it's distorted now. Yeah, it's interesting. Very, so, yeah. so what you're saying, I think, is important that one of the things you probably want to be sure to bring out is register changes. And unfortunately, it's one of the things that gets lost first off on Zoom. Zoom has a, a this sort of um, anti opposed, very opposed to certain aspects of the piano, and one of those is extreme registers. So I probably won't be able to tell that well when you're doing that, and when you played it, I couldn't hear your bass terribly well, um, but it may well not have been you, but rather the Zoom that decided to obliterate it. So I wonder if we could start again, and if you could do two things for me. One of them may feel a little weird, but could you try acting out the way you want that mother to look and feel as you play? Sometimes it's useful, this can feel very unnatural, but sometimes it's useful to play as if people weren't actually hearing you, but just watching you to know how you feel the music should be making them feel. 
Um, so you could, on Zoom, of course, you could even go so far as to put yourself on mute for a moment and let us just watch you play and see if you can show us what the music is saying. And then in the end, you don't necessarily have to act it out so blatantly when you play, but I think you'll find that having gone through that, it will be reflected in how you play. So would you mind just for a couple of minutes, do you have control over Zoom? Can you put yourself on mute? myself on mute. <laughs> She's asking to put myself on mute. So that I can act it out. Just for a moment, you play play like the first phrase and show me how you want it to sound. Just show me. Okay, that's fine. Can I hear you again now? Yeah. Hello. Good. Okay. So I would like something much more extreme. Um, when I watch you, I actually I really can't tell anything about what the music is is trying to convey. So I wonder if you could show me with your body. Um, <laughs> to it that you want the music to have and that there's um there's a kind of undulation to it. because of course the title of right is known owned owned is waves right and they undulate they they rock and so it, it makes perfect sense that the first piece should be a rocking piece so play it this we'll hear you this time but see if you can rock a little more with it. Okay, so leave that for now because I think you don't you don't want to um, be too uh, blatant about what you're doing with your body, and that's fine. That's not the only way at it. But when you're when you're in a practice room, try doing it and see what happens. If as, uh, as if you were an actress um, who was responsible not only for the sound, but for the visual, what you're telling people. Um, and that will get reflected in, in what you play. So then in terms of what you're playing, I'm wondering whether you might find a sound that's a little more filled with color um, by using just a little bit more pedal. So... even more intently. So you know when Dutia lived. Do you know when Dutia was born? Uh, early 1900s. Yeah, I think he was born in 1916. So that means he was born right before Debussy died, right during Ravel's lifetime. Um, He's surrounded by music that's filled with color, right? There's sort of been this explosion of interest in color itself. So if you think about Bach's music, it's not so much about instrumental color, right? You can play a Bach violin concerto on the oboe and it still sounds great, right? But WC's music, you can't play it on another instrument because it's about the instrument. And I think this is also about the instrument. And the sound that you want to get here needs to show me what the piano can do. So try that one more time. Yeah. Okay, I'm of course getting a horribly limited idea of what you're actually doing because of Zoom. But to me, that was far more interesting because there was, there was sort of seeping 
from one note to the next. And I thought that was lovely. Um, can you also now show me that it's interesting when he, um, when he can't decide whether he wants F sharps or F naturals, um, whether he wants later C sharps or C naturals, that this is... Can you just play that first measure and listen to the change from F sharp to F natural? Yeah, take your time. So you, you've got great fingers and you, you get around the keyboard incredibly well. So mostly what I'm going to be asking you to do is to play slowly so that you can listen intensely. So I want you to play very slowly. And I want you to hear F sharp against F natural. And this sort of beautiful ambiguity that that creates. Can you do it once more? Play it as if you love F sharp and F natural. As if you're, you think that those notes are fascinating. Yeah, that's right. So I, I think that um, there's, there's a way that you can play that says to an audience, listen to this. This is especially wonderful. And for me, that those oscillations, that ambiguity, is one of the things that's especially wonderful in this piece. Um, one, one of the things that, that also happens in, um, in French music in the early 20th century, I think, is a kind of embrace of ambiguity. Does that make sense to you? If you, if you think about... Um, Bach and Mozart and Beethoven, they're not about ambiguity so much, right? They, they know exactly what they want to say and they tell you. Um, but can you see how this music is, is willing to say, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. And both of them are so lovely, I can't quite decide. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Have you, have you played much other French music? I played uh, something else by Bichy, Blackbird. Oh, okay, by you. Good for you. Yeah, well, you should go on. You're so such a good pianist. You know what you should play is the um, the, the do you know the three preludes? No, but I've heard of them. Yeah, the, especially the last one, Jeu de Contraire, is really fantastic, and you would play that. You would play that great. Um, but yes, I think that that um. There's, there's something very special about French music that's probably related to the French language. Do you, do you speak any French? Nope. Okay, well, if, if you ever take French, you'll, you'll find that one of the hardest things about the French language is that um, words elide with each other. And so you can't always tell when one word ends and the next one begins. It's really different from German, which is highly articulated. But in French, everything sort of merges together. And I think that's what we hear in the music as well. And that's part of the ambiguity of it, the, the sort of sense that, that one thing blends with another and isn't easily, so easily separable. So before we spend all our time on this one, I want to do one other thing, which is to play off of what you said um, about the importance of the bass coming in. So where would you like to start in order to show that? I don't have measure numbers, but hopefully I can find you. Uh, third line, fourth line, third line. Okay, good, where the bass comes in in octaves. And this is going to be hard on Zoom also, but you notice that it's pianissimo there as opposed to piano. And that's another thing that I think the French composers were so so interested in piano on down, um, so that if, if you can find a sound that's really different than your opening sound, that would be great. So start right there, and let's, let's see if even over Zoom, I can hear a little bit more of the bass.
Okay, so what do you make of the articulation he has there? So for those of you who don't have scores, um, it's a slur with, with dots. Yeah, it's, it's an ambiguous marking, as befits a piece like this, but um, if you can make a little tiny bit of space. So the way I have people try to get the, the kind of articulation that's marked there, the non legato, could you play one note with one finger and just try to connect as best you can? what you want to get. Basically, you want those notes to be as close together as they can be without actually being connected. And then you'll have a real contrast with what the right hand is doing. And because of the pedal, we may not hear it exactly as separated, but we'll get a, a little bit of that hesitation. I'm in the wrong key, aren't I? Sorry. That's what I want to hear. So I would work with that. And now can you play me your right hand? And I wonder if you can make it more songful so that we really get the beat. It's a really, really pretty tune. See if you can make it as lyrical and expressive as possible. Just the right hand. Just the right hand. No, I'm sorry, I should have been clearer. Just the tune. Okay, and remember that color. You can use a little pedal. So Play it as if it's the prettiest song you ever heard. You're going to have to shape it more if you're going to persuade me that it's the prettiest song you ever heard. Okay, you're going to have to have it really grow. That's right. And then maybe you're going to need to use a tiny bit of time to show me where the top of it is. Because the top note is also the biggest interval, right? And the bigger an interval is, the longer it takes us to traverse it. So a little bit to be told. I hear that? Yes, bravo. Okay, let's go on to the next one. I've, I've used up most of our time on this one, but I think some of the things we've talked about here apply to other ones as well. Good. Okay. I love this next one. So this is um, Plaquette about uh, tap dancing, yes? Did you ever take tap dancing as a kid? Nope. No, I didn't either. But I had friends who did. I don't, I don't know if people still do tap. Did you know anyone who did tap dancing? Yeah. 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 I, I, I always thought it was incredibly cool, but that I would be infinitely too uncoordinated to be able to do it. Um, OK, so here. Um, he basically he tells you what he wants the mood to be, which is what? Joyous. Joyous. Okay. So again, I thought that you slightly underdid what the, um, the sort of emotional impact was. I, I felt like you weren't quite as exuberant as you might be, even though you played it incredibly well. So what are, what are the aspects of it that make it sound joyous? Slurs in the left hand. And yeah. The uh, okay. Play me the left hand. Yeah, keep going. Good. Yeah. So even you can probably emphasize that even more. If you land with a little bit. Da, 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 ba, ba, ba. Anything you 
can do to give it a little more emphasis, whatever is interesting, you want to sort of take a highlighter to it. So, and I think every time I ask you, you know exactly what's interesting. So just be a, even more explicit. You know those books that are like for computers, they say like Macs for dummies and all the, that whole series of, okay. So basically, this is gonna sound really insulting to audiences, but it shouldn't. When you're playing for an audience, you gotta assume they don't, they're not listening for the, the quote right things. They don't know what to listen to. So you have to play it as if you're playing it for dummies in a way and say, look at that. So let me hear your left hand and show me what I need to pay attention to. Yeah, so when you have that two note slur, emphasize the first note. Da, da, da. Can you really land on it? That's right, and don't get there early, okay? When you wanna emphasize something, getting there too soon nullifies what you've done. Instead, you want to be as late as you can be without actually being late. Can you try that again? That was great. That's right. Now let me hear your right hand. Good. Okay. And you did a great job there of emphasizing the two note slurs. Can you again follow the direction of the line even more? So when you have that scale going up in the fourth measure, I would crescendo. I know it's uh, you know it's sort of basic and sounds kind of um, maybe reductionist to say that when the music goes up you get louder and when it goes down you get softer. Of course it's not always true, but it's true a lot. So once more the right hand and show me what a sort of joyous achievement it is to get to the top. Just quickly, I just want to cut it and say five minute warning. That sounds like that should be fine, even though we're only through a third of these. It's okay. I think the, the ideas about shaping more and looking for what's exciting to bring out are going to apply to all of them. So what are you going to try to show us here? Uh, something foggy and mysterious. Okay. And um, sad or happy? <laughs> Ambiguous. Okay, start it again and let's see. sad like longing yeah I think so it, it reminds me a little bit not of the actual music but of the mood of a lot of Chopin um, the the sort of there's there's a melancholy in it right it's not it's not tragic you're not like at a funeral um, but it's kind of filled as you said with longing and probably longing for something that that isn't available right which is a, a sort of romantic state of mind um, I think you're going to get that even more if you shape the phrases more. And in this case, the phrase consists at first of just repeated A's. Where does that phrase go? Where is it headed? Getting farther away. Yeah, but I mean, of those in, in those four bars, where are you headed? Down. Yeah, okay, uh, my question is obviously not very clear. Um, it seems to me that you want to go to the third bar. So you've got... 
doesn't mean the third bar has to be louder, but that you can feel a little bit more direction. And that's a useful thing to keep in mind. When you have a four bar phrase, very often you're gonna go to the third bar. And the same is true if you have a four beat idea, very often you're gonna go to the third beat. Okay, play me those, all those A's and show that you, you see what I mean. There, oh, I want you to go to there. I want to feel some urgency. Longing. That's better. And that was actually beautifully legato, too. Okay, good. Mouvement perpetuel. What do you want me to think here? Never ending. <laughs> Yeah, but am I happy to have something never-ending, or am I, um, is it tedious? Happy. Yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah. Joyous. Vif means lively, full of life. Can you start it and make me feel that there's nothing better than to hear this go on forever? Yep. Good. Can you go to the third bar? Can you go, So there's direction. bars as much as the third. I want you to go to the third. Good. Now do that a little bit less, but keep it in your ear. That's right. Excellent. Okay. So that's that one. We're going to plow right ahead. Homage to Bob. So this is full of recollections and memories, right? Because Bach is long in the past. Can you start it once more and show me exactly how you're going to shape it to those top notes? Okay? Beautiful. Your shaping is beautiful. Can you now use your left hand so that it's more filled with nostalgia? Sounds a little neutral. Your left hand sounds like it doesn't care as much as your right hand. And that's a sort of pianist disease. We all feel like our right hand is all that matters, but you are here. as if it were the melody. I think you need to go to here. To you not here. Pretend there's a tenuto over that A, the second A. That's it, exactly. Good, so combine that with your beautiful shaping of the right hand, and I think the piece will be much more poignant. All right, finally the etude. And actually, I have nothing to say in the etude. I thought it was great. So just to sum up, look in each piece for what adjectives you might apply and make sure that every phrase and both hands are sort of combined to bring those out. And in the privacy of your practice room, see if you can act out physically what it is you want to show because that will then come into how you how you perform it okay you did a fantastic job thank, thank you, you so much thank you all right brava karen and uh thank you so much professor kowski for these wonderful illuminating uh comments uh really wonderful um, so now uh, on to more French music or perhaps French slash Polish music, uh, Chopin and a very well-known piece, uh, the Ballade Number no. 1 in G minor, Opus 23, played by Tess Luca.
you. What what a huge and, and difficult piece. So will you, I'm sorry, will you remind me your, of your name? Because I missed it in the beginning. Tess. Tess, thank you. Okay. So, you know, it seems to me that you have every single raw ingredient that you need for this piece, right? You're, you have fast fingers, you have tons of passion, um, you have a really good sense of all the emotional impact of all of it. So I think what it needs is just sort of refinement. That, that basically you, you need to take every passage and make very, very precise decisions about what you want in terms of articulation, what you want in terms of voicing, which hand is going to be more, how you're going to shape the phrase, where is the rubato, because you do all those things, but sometimes you do them in a way that isn't exactly what you want, I think. So um, maybe I'm, I'm going to just take a few examples from the end, and then we'll go back from the, to the beginning. But um, do you have measure numbers in your score? Yeah. OK, good. That makes it easier. So if you look at measure 253, you have this, right? OK, so first of all, where does that come from? Why does he bring that in right at the end there, that figure? Does it sound familiar at all? Um. <laughs> so that's the beginning, right? Composers like to do that. They like to unify their pieces. So the reason I think it's important for you to know that is that what it says to you is that it's actually important for an audience to hear every one of those notes. Because very often, even when we don't consciously know that something relates to something else, we feel it. Um, it's what makes the music feel like it makes sense, you know, and even though you didn't know that that's what that was, I'm sure that somewhere in your subconscious it made sense. So I think you need to pay attention to all of those notes and you need, sorry, my music has been a little bit too well worn, um, but you need to also pay attention to the articulation. So I want to hear you play that a little slower. I want to hear all the notes. I want to hear a beautiful legato and I want to hear the shape of that gesture. Yeah, just play it straight. I don't need a lot of rubato, but so it reminds you. That's right, and even gentler. So I feel like the most important thing that we do when we practice is we listen. Okay, and we try to, and that's the, it's the very hardest thing to do because, of course, it's asking us to be inactive at the same time that we're being active. Um, and so I want you to cease to be the person playing that, who's all excited about the gesture, but rather to listen. Can you do that? Do it in a reflective way, like, oh, those are fascinating intervals. I want them as legato as possible. Was great. I, I would like you to spend a lot of time in this piece playing the fast, loud things slowly and softly and listening like that. So let's let's just take another passage in the coda, um, because the coda is of course the place where you're most likely to feel that you're so engaged in being active that it's hard to really listen. So do you see the passage in 243 to 245? actually starts in 242, but I'm interested in your left hand there. Can you play me your left hand? Your right hand sounds great. Um, that's the... Yeah, just starting from the, um, the diminished seventh chord. Yeah, so I would like to ask you to do a good deal more voicing because there's really a melody there. So I need to hear the E to the F sharp. And Chopin loves to do this where he takes a He takes a portion of what's 
in the right hand and he augments it in the left hand. So I need to hear that much more melodically. Don't think of the chords as sort of homogenized four notes, but rather as, as a shape that you need to bring out. rather than the person doing, and don't make it quite so because it's hard to control it if you're doing that. Just listen to the quality of that chord that has the F sharp on top, the enormous tension in it, but don't slam into it. Instead of concentrating on all the fast notes in the right hand, concentrate on the nobility of that gesture in the left hand. again um, and just pick another passage. Um, could you go, this is like the beginning, but let's do it at the end because it goes somewhere different. 194. Now here, could you play me your right hand? But do you have a slur that goes all the way across to the G, or is there a break? Uh, it goes to the G. It goes to the G. Okay, I am hearing um, a break. I'm hearing... And part of the... Re I, I don't, the break isn't what bothers me quite as much as the, um, the pouncing on the G, the landing. Chopin has moved it to the um, to the offbeat here, and I don't think it goes. Do you? No. No. Okay. So you need to find a way then to control, possibly by finger substitution five, four, three to five, or with your pedal. But I don't want to know that you're picking up your hand there. 
Can you try again? And you feel free to use the pedal to, to blend it together. All right, it was a little too much pedal. It was kind of smudgy, but the legato was tons better. So that's great. Okay, so when we first played it, I missed that. I missed the shaping of that phrase. Then if we go on farther, could you start now at 200? And I want you to listen to the balance between the lines. So, well, play there and then I'll, I'll show you, okay? Just start in um, the pick up to 201, okay? The... Just the right hand? Um, no, both, everything. Yeah, thank you. better this time. Um, the first time I thought that the, the accompanying chords were, were quite a bit too loud. This time they didn't seem as much that way. Um, I think they do take a lot of control. So much of playing the piano is about layering, right? Deciding this is the layer that's on top and this is a subterranean layer. And I, I think you could still do more of that here, where they add agitation and they help to do the crescendo, but they never get in, way, in the way of the top line. So can you try, I guess, the same place or even a bar later? <laughs> mezzo forte going to forte and the inner line with those chords is going to never go above a piano. Can you try that? exactly but I thought that was better next question when you have the figure like this which note is louder um, the first one. yeah exactly and sometimes you're not listening for that sometimes I'm hearing you go it's a it's a quandary because of course you're, you're absolutely right that it's the midst of a crescendo and doesn't a crescendo mean that every note is supposed to be getting louder? You have to have both. You have to have the sense of this, uh, this sort of, you know, this side. And within that, the, the line is growing, sort of, sort of micro versus macro. Can you do it one more time and listen for that as well as the hierarchy of the voices? from the other end. Let's go back um, closer to the beginning. And here I wanted to talk a little bit about pedal, and then I hope we can spend a couple of minutes on the very beginning. Uh, it's easy. I purposely avoided starting at the very beginning because it's easy to spend the entire class on the first eight measures, um, and I, I didn't want to do that. But um, I wonder if you could play, let's see where a good place to start is, I think just at 32. If you can find that. Is that it? That's fine. Yep. exactly what 
what Chopin says about the pedal. But I think you have to modify a little. So Chopin pedaling is, is highly problematic because often he writes things that don't sound great on our piano. If you could listen to the sound you're getting and if it starts to get muddy, make sure that you flutter your pedal. Okay, so when you have all of those big chords in the left hand and you just keep the pedal down for all six of them, I think you're asking for trouble. So I think you need to modify that. Okay, but before you do, I want to say something that relates to what we did before, which is you have separate voices, right? up together and your passion for the intensity of the melodic line is seeping into and we don't want that so could you play it again and listen to the balance and then play that passage that follows and listen for the pedaling okay so balance less left hand and less pedal And that is that you need to decide about the shape. So you come out of it and your, your heart is beating and it's all exciting and you just played great. And you're doing this. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating. But you're not listening to the shape. Right? The D is the top. such a long time to get to the tonic, right? It's really not until measure, what is that, nine? Yes, where you get a full resolution. 
So when you start, I wonder if you could start and make it much more mysterious and play that C as if it's joining a sound that's been ongoing. I wouldn't, to me that's much too definite. So instead, very slowly into the keys, listening to the vibrations. As if it's all sort of searching for its home, rather than as if it's found it. Can you try it? Good, beautiful. So I want to point out one last thing about it and then we'll stop. I think the next thing for you to think about is how to make it more cohesive. It feels as if the rests are slightly, the, it's a little bit dead silence. And I need to hear you thinking across. What you have here really, if you look starting, look starting in measure three, you see the G and then the F sharp and the next measure you get E flat, then D, then C, B flat, and the tune begins, you get B flat, A, G. You have a descending G minor scale across that opening. And if you can hear that all those little fragments cohere, they all come together so that when you finish, it doesn't die, it doesn't stop. Stop, hands in lap, start again. But rather, that F sharp hovers in the air and you pick it up again here. And that D hovers as you wait for the C. over the long, long term. All right? Okay, I fear we have to stop or um, we won't have time for Beethoven. But you did a great job, really. Everything I asked you to do, you did absolutely splendidly. So see, it's a long piece. See if you can take those ideas about voicing and which hand is in charge where and how to shape a legato phrase and apply them all over. You're, it's, you're doing great with this piece. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bravo, Tess. Uh, thank you again so much for these insights, Professor Kautsky. And now we have our final performer. And uh, this will be something of a reunion. Uh, this is uh, Sarah Sabown, who you might remember from Interharmony, um, a uh, repeat um, uh, participant of the Interharmony Festival, just as we are repeat artist faculty, so we can all pretend we're um, in, Italy. In, in Italy right now, yes. And, Did you bring any Chianti? Jeff? Oh my God, if only. <laughs> Uh, no Chianti, I'm afraid, today, but we have so many rain checks along yes. those lines for sure, and Barolo as well. Yes, even better, yes. Even better, yes. So here is Sarah Sabown uh, performing the first movement of Beethoven's Sonata in B-flat major, opus 22, marked Allegro con brio. And Sarah, you'll do it without the repeat, yes? Uh, she, she can't hear you right now. Oh. Sarah, just do it, do it without, do it without the repeat.
Good. Thank you, Sarah. I think this is a really hard movement, I must say. I don't play this sonata. Um, I have taught it, and when I look at it, I'm like, wow, that is really tricky. Um, your, your, fin your fingers are great. And I think you're kind of, you're, you're not displaying them as well as you might. You get around so well, and sometimes you cover what you're doing by smashing down the pedal. And so what I really want to do is work on it just to, to see how clean you can get it. Because I feel like there's, the obstacles aren't technical, um, which is fantastic. I think it's mostly that you, um, you just, you kind of check out of listening and let your fingers do the work. And if you can keep listening while your fingers are doing the work, it'll be great. Um, so one, uh, uh, one example right near the end was where you have that broken octave passage um, in 185, 86. And I thought, it sounded like you could play it really well, but you covered it with the pedal. So I couldn't tell that you were playing it well. So uh, can you play your right hand there? Yeah, or you can, um, well, one, it would be 185, pick up to 185, where the broken octaves begin. Hmm. I think I have it down. No, I, I'm down, I'm doing the ascending scale, actually. So, you don't have measure numbers? I do, but I think they're different for some reason. Oh, dear. Okay. Um, well, it's where you start at...
deciding on the balance of the orchestra, right? Making sure that the tubas aren't louder than the oboes and the flutes, and that you can always hear the violins and not just the trumpets and trombones. So basically, your two hands are different instruments, and you need to tell them which instrument needs to be louder. Don't, don't rely on them, they won't know. Okay, it's like an elementary school orchestra. <laughs> they don't know, <laughs> and you need to tell them. Let's, can we do the second theme? We might, since you, it's probably easier for you to find, let's do it the second time. So, in the upbeat to 162. Um, and I want you to listen here for voicing. So do you know what I mean by voicing? Yeah. Okay, I mean which, which, which of the notes you're bringing out, yes? Mm -hmm. So which, in the right hand, which note do you think you want to bring out? Are, are you referring to this one? of line if I don't, you don't hear a line right so if I instead whoops sorry I'm gonna fall off my bench here here that's such a different sound right mm -hmm. there's it's like you find the sweet spot in that top note and you hear it growing. So where where's the peak of the phrase? Um, exactly, and you know I think I know it seems maybe it seems infantile, but I think it's really useful to mark it to take your phrases and like put I put a down an arrow, and I I do this in my own music like this is where I'm going because when I record myself. I find that I haven't done nearly, I haven't made things nearly as clear as I thought that I was. Okay? So yes, I think you want to really build to this. And then a very legato. And, and really, really low at the end. So it's a typical Beethoven phrase in that it covers a huge gamut of the dynamic range. Okay, one more time with the voicing and the shaping. That's it. You can drop a lot more at the end of the phrase, though. So I'm, I make my students breathe, like audibly breathe, so I hear that they have ended a phrase, and they hate, I don't think they particularly enjoy that aspect of their lessons, but I still think it's good to do. That, that if you can't catch your breath in there, you're probably not really phrasing. So can you just do 168, and I want, see if you can wheeze loud enough that Zoom will actually convey it to me thousands of miles away. Oh, you have to go on or we won't know if the timing's okay. So it's kind of a catch breath. You don't have long to do it, but it fits. Let's hear it again. Okay, so just where is the breathing after? Oh, you tell me. Where is the breathing? Oh, um, at the last? 
at the end of the thing? Yeah, it's you have to fit in a breath between this note and this one. <gasps> right in between. <gasps> Can you hear mine? Yes. That's good. See, I just got a new puppy and I'm allergic to him. <laughs> so I'm doing a really great job of wheezing. But maybe you... <laughs> You can do the same thing, okay. even without a new puppy. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear your I'm actual sorry, breath, but I heard your time. musical breath. So that that was good enough. That was that was that was excellent. Okay, can you do one more thing for me in that passage, and can you show me? Actually, two more things. Can you show me that the intervals are growing when you're going up? So, from here to here is a sixth, another sixth, another sixth, and then an octave. And the octave takes longer than the sixth does. Do you play any other instrument or do you sing? No. Okay, that's all right. Um, it doesn't matter because you can imagine it. If you played the violin, you would have to stretch further to get to do a larger interval. And if you're singing, you can practice again in, in your um, in privacy of your practice room. But you'll see it's harder to get up there. That's how I want it to feel. Can you try that? Yeah, try that first and then I'll say the other thing. so that it distorted the rhythm, but that was, that's not a bad thing to do. And that your timing was great and your voicing is really spectacular now. It's, that's fantastic. One last thing in this passage. He changes the articulation and you have this long line of six legato chords in measure 166, 67. with your hand or you can use the pedal either way is fine but what isn't fine is because it needs to really be gluey so that then this sounds different okay so can you start right here and play it slowly and glue those chords together yeah that's right changed your fingering, right? You just listened Not really, to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, perfect. Okay, now let's go back to the beginning, okay? So, tell me about this opening figure. What, what kind of, what kind of mood is Beethoven establishing here? Um, I, I think it's lighthearted, um, kind of fun. Yeah, I think so too, and it's kind of it's kind of interesting if you put it in context to the um, the sonatas that surround it. So, do you know what the next sonata is? Do you know Opus Twenty Six at all? Yeah. yeah okay, right. what's it like? It's um, it's well, I I know it's Chopin's favorite sonata. Oh, actually, that's interesting. I didn't realize that. But that's because of the funeral march. Maybe. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Professor Burleson said that a long time ago. So okay, well, I can imagine that that's, I'm sure he's right. So <laughs> why, why would it have been Chopin's favorite, other than the fact that Chopin was interested in the funeral march? Um, well, I think it's, it's, it's also just very, um, the, the first movement is the Schumann Variations, and it's very, um, I mean, it's, it's just very beautiful and I don't know how to describe yeah, it. Yeah, no, you're, 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 you're totally right. You're describing it with your hands, if, mm -hmm. if nothing else. Yeah, it's, it's very expressive and lyrical, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. yeah, and what about the Papatique Sonata before Opus yeah, 22? It's, it's darker. 
It's very dark and passionate, light and restless and agitated. So this one couldn't be more different from what comes before and what comes after it. Um, it seems like he's, he's, it's, it's funny. Don't you think it's, it's kind of jerky? Um, and, and instead of um, writing a long, beautiful melody, he writes this tiny sort of epigrammatic little figure. So tell me about that figure. Can you, can you tell me any other places that this appears in the, in the movement? It does. It comes back at the end, which is kind of cool. Um, and it comes back all over the, the beginning, too, right? So he puts it underneath in that whole series, and then again um, at measure eight. Right? He, Beethoven wants to be sure that you understand that that figure is really important. Um, and then it's pretty cool how it comes back in measure 59. Um, where it's, it's in a different rhythm, right? Okay, and then there it is again. So he's sort of, um, he's being kind of obsessive um, about this figure. If you can catch the, the wit of that when you start, it would be great. So it's kind of sly. If you can, if you can, if you can sort of be a little bit more tricky about it when you begin. Right, and make sure that you shape it. Yeah. Not, not the same. No two notes in a row the same. Okay, try again. Yeah, can you be, I know it's hard, but can you be clear about it? I'm not hearing four notes really cleanly. And they're going to be so important for this movement that you need to absolutely spell them out to start with. Yes. Okay. So remember that sound and insist on that from yourself. That's what I mean, that your fingers are better than you're giving them credit for. You see what I mean? Like you're really able to do all of this stuff. But sometimes it's not coming across because you're not insisting on it. So your practicing should really consist of a lot of very slow, very careful iterations that every note is the way you want it to be. So I'd like to do a little of that with you. So could you go on, but not up to tempo, like at that tempo, okay? And we're just going to make sure every note is the way you want it. Okay, starting from the beginning or just continue? No, you, the beginning is already great. <laughs> so start from the next, whatever that is, measure, the pick up to measure three. Let's do that up to tempo. Yeah, and that's actually sort of spectacular. So you've got, I really think you've got to like show off. I'm, I'm kind of serious about it that you're, you're, um, you're not letting us see how, how brilliantly actually you, you, you can play. In the next passage, he does something interesting, which is that he transfers those 16th notes into the left hand. Right? Not the same motive, but the, the rhythmic idea. And when you played it, I couldn't hear them. Again, I knew you were playing them fine, but you covered them with the pedal. And when you do that, they lose their energy. So I want... I want that rather than... Okay? So let's do that slowly first, and then we'll do it faster. So no pedal? No. Um... I wouldn't say no pedal. I would say very little pedal. So I'm tapping the pedal every beat. I'm using the pedal. I, I would rarely use no pedal in Beethoven. Okay. But sometimes you want to use the pedal in a way that just makes the sound more alive, not that, um, that uh, merges the sounds. Okay. It's no too much pedal. But let's do your left hand alone. Okay, left hand and pedal. But 
very little power. Still too much. It's still too much. So I want it to be absolutely transparent, as if you're you're on your tiptoes. Let's do it with no pedal to start with. So like fairies, fairies dancing. Yeah, and what dynamic level do you want? Uh, well, a piano. Yeah, but probably actually pianissimo. Because okay. if it's an accompaniment and the passage is piano, mm -hmm. your accompaniment needs to be notably softer than your melody is. So I would think that you want that to be basically as soft as you can make it and still have the notes um, sound. So what you're doing is you're providing a kind of bubbling energy underneath, but you don't really want me to notice it. I just want it bubbling, seething. Yes. There you go. Okay, now, can you add to that just a tap with the pedal on every beat? So you're, gonna, you're just going to make the B flat that your fifth finger is playing a little more vibrant. No, it's already getting muddy. Okay. <laughs> Do you cook? A, a little bit. Okay, so it's like if you're adding red pepper. Okay. A little bit goes a long way. Okay. Even that seems too muddy to me. Okay. I want it really, really light. Okay, so at this point, it's it's the pedaling, or it's or it's both pedaling. You know, unfortunately, because it's on Zoom, I can't tell. Okay, okay. So you have to be my ears. Okay. Is that pianissimo? Is that as soft as you can play? Uh, probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay, so that's better. It's still not quite clean enough, but it's a whole lot better. So let's add the right hand to that. And I think the takeaway from that is that you need to really spend a lot of time playing each hand alone and making sure you have exactly the sound you want. It all comes back to the same thing. Exactly the sound you want at every moment because you're able to do it. All right, both hands there, okay? It's so much better, Sarah. It's so much better. Okay. Keep going, sorry. Okay. okay, next thing. Which of these is dissonant and which is consonant? So I'm in measure six. This with the E flat with this chord, is that dissonant? Yeah. Or is that dissonant? Which is the more dissonant? E. Pardon me? E, e flat. Absolutely. That means the E flat is louder. Mm -hmm. And that gesture, especially in classical music, but not just in classical music, it's all over the place. Where's the tension in the harmony? And where's the release in the harmony? And when you do that, that means you need to shape it. The, the English language is great for that because you can always put words to it. Sobbing, crying, weeping, whatever you want. But it always is that loud, soft. So play that passage once more and do that shape. Okay, we have to stop in a minute, but I want you to do one more thing for me. You see that those notes have a slur in the right hand, right? Both the first time and the second time, this thing. Okay, the second one especially, because it had a crescendo, you stopped thinking about the legato and you did this. And you started to force your sound. I want you to do the crescendo, but I want it to still be lyrical. Right? He's in B 
embedded that opening idea into this lovely lyrical cantabile phrase. So I want to hear... Can you just play me the right hand starting in pick up to measure seven and see how cantabile you can make it. Yeah, and that doesn't make it for me because it still sounds... is if you start less. When you start a phrase loudly, it's very hard for it to go anywhere. So if you start from under, sorry, and then grow, it's gonna have a lot more direction. So start less. There you go. Okay, and I see it's three o'clock and Jeff said we needed a hard stop. So I am going to do a hard step. I'm going to take just a second to summarize with you because you, you really did a great job of making all those changes. So we started with those broken octaves. And as soon as you took away all the pedal, and as soon as you voiced down the left hand, they sounded spectacular, right? Then we went and we did the second theme, the T, right? And as soon as you voiced that and then shaped it to the top, and adjusted your timing to the interval and breathed at the end of the phrase, it sounded absolutely spectacular. Then we went to the beginning and I made you make sure that every note really sounded in that opening thing, right? That you couldn't just sort of get by with one or the other of them, not quite even. And then they were all there. And then you did the left hand and you did it by itself and gradually it got cleaner and cleaner, right? And then you did the right hand at the end and you paid real attention to the, uh, the legato and you had a gorgeous shape. So all of that material was there for you, okay? Just have, have the confidence in yourself to insist that it be to that standard because you have everything available to make it that way, okay? Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. All right, brava Sarah, thank you so much. Professor, uh, brava, bravi to all the performers today. Uh, Professor Kowski, thank you so much for these wonderful insights and illuminations and uh, sharing your time and wisdom, and wisdom and expertise with us and trying to cut through the uh, fidelity issues with Zoom, uh, which hopefully we can all stop doing um, cease doing very, very soon. I think that it's very optimistic that in the fall uh, we won't be doing things like this, but this has been a, a, a great um, interim for us to do this in the hall and for, for students not to be broadcasting from their individual homes. So this has been really it's great already, for us here. Yeah, and you know, it's so weird that the Zoom sound is so limited, but sometimes I think it's good because it makes people exaggerate so much in order that it be heard. So in order for a pianissimo to sound pianissimo, you have to play so softly. Um, so in that sense, there's, there's, there's actually a little bit of virtue in it. But. We've all learned so much about broadcasting in this year, and that's, it's, not, it's actually not a bad skill you know, for all of us to have um, proliferated with and uh, is with regard to our, our knowledge and experience, you know, frankly. So we try to look at the, the lemonade side of things when we can. <laughs> but uh, it was just so splendid having you here. And next time it will be in person. Great. You know, we will make that happen. Okay. And um, yeah, yes, thank you so much. Stay well. We'll be in touch soon. That sounds um, great. And thank yeah. you to all those students who were all, really one and all. So, so much fun to work with. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I will relay that to them um, since they can't hear you right now. Okay. One of the one of the limitations of of this this format, the necessary limitations. Well, you have great students, so I mean, they are they are great. wonderful. They're yes, great. they're they're all a real joy, really? and uh, you know I feel blessed yeah. to have them. Yeah, that was yeah. great. Okay. Thank all you. right. Thank you, you Professor Kautsky. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Okay. We will talk soon. Sounds good. Yeah. All right, stay well. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.